Today we have the great honor of being joined here on Seamus Conversations by the eminent Egyptian political scientist Imad Shaheen. Professor Shaheen is currently on leave as a professor of public policy at the American University in Cairo. He is now visiting professor of political science at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service in Washington and a distinguished visiting scholar at Columbia University in New York. His many books include Political Ascent, Contemporary Islamic Movements in North Africa. He's the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and Politics and the co-editor with John Esposito of the Oxford Handbook of Islam and Politics. Professor Shaheen, it's an honor and a, and, a, and a pleasure to have you here in Denver. Welcome to Denver, your first time here. Thank you for joining us for this interview. Thank you so much for inviting me. The honor is mine, as a matter of fact. Thank you. So, there's so much to discuss with you, Professor Shaheen. You're one of the preeminent political scientists uh, in Egypt. Um, but I'd like to discuss a recent article that you've published um, with the very interesting title, Lessons Not Learned, Trading Democracy for Neoliberal Militarism in Egypt. Let's unpack this term, neoliberal militarism. I saw in the text that you actually footnote another author, an exactly. Egyptian author. Exactly. He's the one who coined it, but then you use the term to analyze the current situation in Egypt today. Right. Please give us a sense of what you mean by neoliberal militarism. Actually, the term is in use now, is in vogue in Egypt, as many people are actually feeling the uh, impact uh, of the type of regime that's uh, being uh, uh, ruling, this ruling Egypt right now. What we mean by neoliberal militarism, it's the combination, I call it ex explosive uh, combination mm. of uh, neoliberal economic policies uh, uh, and, and uh, authoritarian, more or less repressive uh, measures. Yes. Right. In order, of course, to offset the downside or the shortcomings of neoliberal and liberalization, neoliberal economic policies and liberalization. What do we mean by neoliberal? You know, of course, that this term is associated uh, in, in recently with the increasing globalization and the call from international financial institutions to many third world countries to start adopting uh, neoliberal policies. So they privatization, call, exactly, deregulation. Exactly, the example is deregulation, privatization. Uh, shrinking of the public uh, sector. Shrinking of the public sector. Uh, Slashing of social safety nets. <laughs> <All right>. Sorry. <laughs> and decreasing public spending, government spending, and so on. That's the new liberal, the, the, the liberal part. Yes. The militarism, of course, is the uh, deliberalization at the political level. Mm. In other words, that the regime, while the repressive regime, authoritarian regime, or any kind of regime, that while doing this, still insist, they are kind of concerned about their stability, about the uh, impact of these policies, the social and economic impact of these policies on socioeconomic stability in general. So they resort to, or they continue, the yes. repression, the uh, firm grip over society. Yes. By, in this situation, of course, the neo, uh, or the militarism, the increasing role of the military in the decision-making process and, in, of course, in the economic activities of the country. This is exactly what we see now in Egypt and actually distinguishes this regime from the previ previous one, from which the Mubarak is Mubarak's regime. regime, exactly, that we, we see here. Because you say in the article, the neoliberalism in Egypt is nothing new. It's nothing this goes new. back to the early exactly. 1970s. Right, right. What's new is actually the assignment, the assignment of massive projects to the military. Military. The military. What's new is the uh, entrenchment, relatively speaking, because again, this is not new, but now we have in most ministries, in most public... Uh, 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 institutions, uh, we see the uh, more presence of, uh, for example, military generals uh, that are now uh, taking most of the decisions, having the authority or some kind of oversight authority over the operation of certain ministries, including even the Ministry of Endowment. Wow. So now the military has long had a very powerful role 
in the Egyptian state. Yes. But what you're arguing is that it's actually consolidating even more and becoming a, a larger force in the Egyptian economy under Sisi. This is true. Why? Because there are s several reasons for this. Uh, the, the, the power base. Like, uh, uh, Sisi still has not freed himself from his military background. That, of course, will take a while. And at the same time, I think, that's my view, that he's cautious in terms of um, trying to uh, forge a, a new power base away from the military establishment. So this is exactly a, one of the uh, instruments that he has to rely on in order to consolidate power, to um, uh, feel more secure, and also he, f he knows that the uh, state institutions in general are in a state of decay, and he cannot rely on them for whatever plans or for to, to at least jumpstart the economy once again. So he's relying instead on the military. Right. And it becomes a whole package. Yes. A whole package in terms of decision making, in terms of recruitment, in terms also of the relationship, which is very important, between the presidential institution, which is very powerful, supposedly, yes. and very instrumental in Egypt, and the military establishment. So this, of course, is still in the making. This kind of relationship yes. it's still in the making. It seems to be a close one where the military, maybe this is something also unique in Egypt, starting the military establishment is starting to have an upper hand over the presidential institution. So the balance of power between the presidency exactly. and the and military right. is now actually turning in the military's favor. And this is, of course, reflected in the constitution itself, which gives some kind of immunity, quote unquote, to the minister of defense at the expense of the, quote unquote, the civilian president. Okay. Now, you diagnose all of this, and then you argue that yes. this direction in Egypt today is a recipe for disaster right. in terms of economic development and certainly in terms of democracy. I think that piece of the puzzle Definitely. is relatively clear. But in terms of economic growth even, you say, in yes. other words, on its own terms, yes. this uh, the current formula in Egypt is not going to lead to economic right. prosperity or growth. Right. If we look at the larger picture, because the two elements are missing. One, of course, the political will to uh, initiate or to carry out institutional reform, massive institutional reform that Egypt uh, requires and needs. And what we mean by institutional reform, we're talking about starting from the bureaucracy all the way to, for example, the institutions of coercion, Ministry of Interior, the military itself, the relationship between the military and the civil institution, or civilian institutions, massive, massive reform in every aspect and every respect, and which we see also in some of the manifestation now of what seems to be a failure of the Egyptian state at least to provide the basic services, services like, for example, electricity, water. And you yes. see, of course, the complaints that uh, are taking place. This is one thing. The second dimension which is missing and also essential for that recipe of reform and growth is the issue of, again, political will and strong determination to fight corruption. Yes. On both grounds, uh, uh, General Sisi expressed his stances and where he stands in uh, with vis-a-vis -vis the two positions. Which is hostile. Example, in institutions, he mentioned more than once that we are not here to reform institutions. We are not here to rehabilitate, to restructure institutions because that will affect the state itself and might lead to dismantling the state apparatus in right. general, which he's trying to avoid. Same thing about corruption. Like he says, for example, that the subsidies are more dangerous than corruption in Egypt. And so subsidies were recently cut. Exactly. So exactly. So he took the very bold, of course, uh, measure of, of, of rolling back subsidies, something that, of course, previous presidents uh, have not been able or daring to accomplish, but we, he did. Uh, 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 benefiting from actually a state of fear that he managed or he had managed to reinstate, starting from the coup, the massacres, the systematic repression of, pro uh, of pro uh, demonstrations and protests, yes. the arrest of like the icons of the revolution, the, 2000, the 2011 uh, uh, yes. institution uh, uh, revolution, people like Ala Abdel Fattah and uh, Doma and others, yes. uh, and Ahmed Maher, of course. The crackdown. Uh, it, it, the massive crackdown. In addition, of course, and you know, you know, of course, the toll, the, the, the end toll. Like, you know, the, of course, the numbers vary, but I think a very reasonable number that's often repeated is that at least 3,000 3, have been killed in that crackdown. 
16,000 have been injured, and we have 40,000 have been either detained or have been exposed to uh, some kind of judicial accountability. You're talking about the Rabah massacre. The Rabah massacre, the Nahda massacre, and other massacres. That and Human Rights Watch place. recently issued a major report on exactly. this, which their director, Ken Roth, tried to right. deliver in person exactly. to the exactly. Egyptian government. Right. They were not even allowed to leave right. the airport. Yes, and also the uh, United Nations yesterday issued also a report in which they uh, pointed to the responsibility of Sisi in, in these massacres. Yes. So, um, in this article, um, you actually compare Egypt under Sisi yes. to both Chile under Pinochet, right. Right. which had a similar combination of right. economic privatization right. with political repression and authoritarianism. And what I would, and also in the Arab world, we had a similar model under Ben Ali, yes. because that was a similar model. In someone, Tunisia. In Tunisia, someone, a general coming from the state apparatus, state security apparatus, yes. and he uh, projected himself as a... Uh, a driving force for uh, economic growth, economic uh, modernization, modernization in the, uh, uh, and development. But in a Tunisia repressive at police the, state modernization. Exactly, at the expense of individual rights, human rights, democracy, all these can wait until the economic growth uh, is achieved. People will be, their standard of living is higher. They f forget about their basic and the fundamental rights of freedom right. and stuff like that because they fed their mouth and so on. So what I'm arguing is this kind of individual autocratic model yes. is not going to, to succeed. Even if we take the exa example of Pinochet, because there is a lot of similarity. Yes. There's a lot of similarity between Chile and, and Egypt and so on. In the end, in the end, the model failed despite the fact that he relied on what he called, or what's called the Chicago uh, school. school and so on. CC doesn't have the Chicago school. They are generous and everything. But in the end, in the end, this model is bound to fail. I, I, I will say why. Uh, right now, after I talk about China. China okay. is a state model. Yes. So if the individual autocratic model, that's what I'm trying to argue, will not uh, uh, succeed in Egypt, because in that case, if we follow in Chile, Egypt had already uh, embarked on a massive liberalization uh, uh, model in the, starting from uh, 1970s. 1970s. If, yeah. we, if you take, so that's open door policy and more rationalized uh, model or, uh, in, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and so on, and it didn't succeed. Right. The same thing about China, that you know, the state can be, as an ideology, still uh, 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 repressive, yes. not free, and, uh, and that, but at the same time adopt some kind of a liberal uh, model, and which is the new liberalism, and so on. Uh, what I'm saying is that Egypt lacks, of course, some of the elements that existed in China, like in terms example, of state structures, leadership, the leadership, the kind of you know like really visionary leadership. We don't have a, a vision, economic vision for to take us out from from this kind of shambles. The visionary leadership, the uh, the, the the state discipline, yes. the bureaucracy, the discipline, the rule of law, and so on. Even even if it's uh, uh, aggressive, authoritarian, but, uh, authoritarian, but it's but, effective. But at least exactly, it's in effective. In, in, exactly in terms of curbing corruption. In terms of getting, you know, like the whole machinery yes. working and so on towards that moment. Egypt lacks this. Okay. The, the, the bureaucracy is completely decaying, completely decaying, corrupt, and also the bureaucracy itself would eventually um, challenge any attempt at restructuring and reform. It's a massive project. In a divided society like Egypt, and this is again the main message that I would, as I was, I'm trying to, to convey. Yes. In a divided society like Egypt, all these kind of you know, bold, grand projects need some kind of, if not consensus, at least consent. Some kind of legitimacy, some kind of popular support behind yes. it. Yes, and that, that does not exist Definitely today. It doesn't exist, and it also doesn't seem that the regime is keen on uh, uh, forging or building up or restoring some kind of social peace and national reconciliation. Right. Right. This is one thing. The other thing which is extremely important is the orientation of the regime, this current regime in terms of basic, basic requirements like rule of law. Yes. Like respect of fundamental rights, like the issue of democracy and representation, the issue of inclusiveness, the issue of, as I mentioned, I'm repeating this again because it's extremely important, restoring social peace. Yes where people really, Egypt can move at. Well, their idea of restoring social peace is it, simply to eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. Uh, uh, official enemies, yes. um, namely the Muslim Brotherhood, exactly. and now others, right. actually, as you say, exactly. other liberal right. and right. secular uh, opposition and then forces. And regiment society, 
you turn society into a state of war. Yes. One people fighting other people. Uh, and, 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 and this idea, like all, all, all the massive projects have, be, have to succeed, not because of, you know, like really a, a clear economic vision and a clear economic strategy or even long-term strategy, but because we are in a state of war. Yes. Uh, who, state, state of, of war, emergency. Yes, inside and outside. We're being targeted. So therefore, you know, like, you know. Yes. Under a state of war, uh, many, many rules and norms and standards could be easily violated. Of course. And then the media, of course, plays in Egypt, uh, particularly these days, the media has been playing really, really a, uh, an extremely counterproductive, if not really destructive role in terms of dividing society, fomenting hatred. Exactly. Uh, promoting almost violence. And the Discourses of eliminationism elimination. and demonization. Exactly. exactly. Terrorists. Exactly. Not, yeah. exactly. Um, there's so much more to discuss, Professor Shaheen, but I'd like to close with this because I found this particular passage in your article very, if you will, pregnant with um, possibilities. You conclude, until a critical mass forms, the more likely outcome is that the hard-pressed, marginalized majority of Egyptians would engage in silent civil disobedience that furthers state fragility and stability. Um, you also say, you pose this question to your fellow Egyptians. You say, is it worth for Egyptians to lose democracy and human rights? for unlikely economic success. So I'd like you to just elaborate on this a little bit. Yes. Where do you see these uh, trends in Egypt today? What happens on the other side of the equation, as you suggest here? Yes. I believe that uh, even on the uh, short term, uh, coercion and repression is not going to succeed, it's not going to work. And uh, people on the right state of mind especially when we're talking about regimes that are trying really to work for, if we assume that they are trying to work for the benefit of the, of the nation at large. They need actually to restore uh, uh, social peace and, and national rec reconciliation, achieve national reconciliation. Why? And it's, it's very problematic, by the way, because unfortunately, the regime, without even realizing, it's placing itself as part of this polarization g game which is very extremely dangerous because it mm -hmm. becomes part of the, like one side of the war. Yeah. And actually there should be a time where the regime, the president, those in power have to at least, you know, lift themselves a little bit up mm -hmm. and, and rise above the equation, above, above these conflicts and, and then come back again and try to uh, achieve some kind of inclusiveness, integration, peace in society in order to move ahead. This is not happening and this is really the big dilemma. Because you know they will keep repressing, repressing, repressing until repression is not going to work, and might even lead to counter violence. And we see the symptoms of this happening, and some kind of you know like um, some elements are resorting to some kind of you know sporadic violence here and there, Sinai, some uh, explosions of bombs here and there against some government institutions, even the tactics. Wasn't this predictable in a sense because exactly. of the exactly. dismantling exactly. of Egypt's democratic transition? Many of those um, who argued that the Muslim Brotherhood had made a big mistake by playing the game of democracy, right? They had argued right. you cannot achieve right these goals through democra the democratic process. And the Muslim Brothers said, no, yes, yes we can, and we're going to work within the system gradually right. and pragmatically. Right. And now some of those more anti-democratic forces right. in the Islamist camp are saying, you see, we're vindicated now. This shows that we were right all along, and the Muslim Brothers were delusional to think that they could ever play the democratic game. And clearly, the only path for us is armed resistance. I hope that this represents or is always or remains confined to a small fringe on the margins on the margins of the mainstream and this is that because what you said I want I really don't want to repeat what you said but you are really uh, right on the point that if you remember even during the Arab uh, popular uprisings for democracy and change and so on even the, the western media and the american press and so they started to see, see that this was actually a defeat of for radicalism right. and and the, the the theory and the hypothesis of al-qaeda and so on and all these kind of radical and terrorist organization that you know like violence and and so on that whole world and, seemed and, and completely and irrelevant to the right, moment of right. democratic transformation exactly. three years later now now the radicals as you said have been vindicated or the 
Or well, at least they think they, they have. Think, they think that they have been vindicated, exactly. And this is one, one, one rule. And the second one is the mainstream. Like, the, the first rule is, it's, the solution is democracy. Right. The solution is rule of law. The solution is pluralism and inclusiveness. Yes. And we have to reach that one way or another. And we will make mistakes because, you know, this is something new to all of us. Right. Look at Iraq, look at Syria, These are look at Egypt. These are countries that have been under the yoke of authoritarianism, repression for 60 years. It, this type of or style of rule has even affected our political behavior, mm. our political values, mm. our culture, our ability to work together collectively. Yes. So we really need time to get out of this kind of, you know, state of mistrust and a state of suspicion and so on in order and, and in order to embark on democracy which comes with a lot of uncertainty but people but in the end it's it's a thin line that you cross this uncert uncertainty in order to reach stability this is exactly exactly the essence and also that you resort to peaceful means of resolving conflicts in society that's exactly what we all seek to achieve right. and so on. The second rule actually that should not be violated is once you crack down on mainstream Islamic movements, what you get is fringy, shadowy, uh, radical terrorist movement and so on. The, right. It's similar of, of ISIS and ICE and so on and, yes. and, and, and so forth. Yes. This is exactly because the safeguard here is not a security solution and try to bomb here and there. The safeguard actually is always to maintain the center the mainstream of Islamic movements. But when you destroy that democratic space... The void has to be filled by radicals or some other uh, forms of uh, religious expression. Yes. That's not actually product productive in most cases and does not resolve the issue because the center is a center. And most democracies are built on a, main, a center mainstream. Professor Shaheen, thank you so much for your time and chatting with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.